We have known for a while that the time between birth and the age of six are critical development years. But recent studies show that when it comes to mental health, this stage in life plays an even larger role than previously believed. Joining us now for more, in the nation's capital, Dr. Paul Rumeliotis, Chief Medical Officer of Health for the Eastern Ontario Health Unit and the author of Baby Comes Home, A Parent's Guide to a Healthy and Well First 18 Months. And with us in studio, Dr. Jean Clinton, Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University in Hamilton and lead author of the Provincial Report, Supporting Ontario's Youngest Minds, Investing in the Mental Health of Children Under Six. Dr. Peter Zatmari is here. He's chief of the Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative between CAMH, the Hospital for Sick Children, and the U of T. And Kimberly Moran, president and CEO of Children's Mental Health Ontario. And it is great to welcome you two back. Dr. Paul, Dr. Jean, I think first time for you two on the program. So nice to have you here for the first time. Let's talk about these early years, zero to six. Can children this young, Dr. Jean, start us off. Can children this young develop serious mental illness? What we know from the literature is absolutely yes, which is to many a surprise. People think that they're too young to have any of these challenges, but we know that children can experience anxiety, depression, attentional problems. And in fact, the incidence of it is as high in zero to six as it is in the rest of childhood and adolescence. So we're talking about one in four, one in five from international, uh, international studies. So absolutely, yes. What about, Dr. Paul, the existence of this mental illness in children? Would it be as prevalent as, say, in adults? I, I think that um, as, as they get older, I think that uh, the, the concept of mental illness in, in children is a bit more complicated than just the, the typical mental health that we sort of see or, or imagine in adults. There are a variety of developmental issues that um, are wrapped up under the mental health sort of development scheme. And if you look at uh, early child mental health, it really has to do with the development of the child's ability to interact with their peers, interact with society, learn and so on, self-regulation. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong and so I don't li really label it, as, label it as mental health per se, but I think these are markers or precursors for mental health later on in life. If that's the case, Dr. Paul, how is somebody who is four or five years old, uh, you know, whose communication skills may be somewhat limited to begin with compared to later on in life, how are they supposed to articulate that they are suffering from some kind of mental illness? Well, the, the important thing in pediatrics is that you need to be able to look at the child's uh, uh, activity, interactions, uh, interactions with others, relationships, uh, and sort of peer-to-peer -peer and parent-to-adult relationships. So uh, those are signs that a child, uh, you, ch for example, if a child doesn't interact properly with another, if a child is always withdrawn, doesn't have eye contact. Those are the things that are, that are very nonverbal for us to be able to see and sometimes challenging as a pediatrician to be able to pick up mental illness in the child that's very young. However, these developmental problems or these interrelationship or these peer relationship issues should strike an alarm, regardless of the fact that the child may not be able to really specifically articulate his or her anxiety or fears. Dr. Jean, you want to come back on that? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think what we need to be thinking of is the um, that children under six actually do experience um, uh, difficulties that can be diagnosed. And this is relatively new information. People didn't look under six. So uh, uh, Dr. Paul's exactly right. What happens early um, uh, affects what happens later. Many of the children with diagnosable issues in under six go on to have um, uh, later uh, uh, difficulties. But I think it's really important to recognize that children under six also are showing in the kinds of ways that Dr. Paul is, um, is talking about actual significant difficulties which are outside of what you expect for normal. So if we expect as um, if we expect that the challenge and the development of social and emotional capacity is like building a muscle, you have to do lots of reps of it, right? So you need to do reps in um, uh, relationships, building peer and adult relationships, that's a big task. You need uh, to learn how to manage and express your emotions, that's the E. Um, and then uh, you also um, have to be able to look at being able to play and engage in your environment. So that's normal social and emotional development. 
when we see that going off, when kids are not developing relationships, as Dr. Zatmari will talk about with autism, uh, when kids are not able to manage their emotions, so they've got intense crying, they've got major meltdowns that last for hours, um, they have difficulty sleeping because they can't settle themselves. So in that emotion, they're not following along the normal, um, and then they're not playing. Um, they're not exploring. So these are all the signs you should These look are for. all, the, this what is no, normal is, is that rep that you practice mm -hmm. and build, because the building of the brain is built through experiences. Mm -hmm. You're not born with a complete brain yet. Gotcha. Kimberly, let me get you in here at this point, because uh, you have been on this program before, but not in this studio. You were at the uh, makeshift studios in Leaside last time we all got together. Yes. And you did, you, I mean, this is obviously not an academic exercise for you. This no. is, uh, this was real life for you once upon a time. Yes, it was. Your daughter was how old when she first manifested mental illness? She was issues? 11. She, uh, she started saying that she was sad when she was 11. But you know, when, we, when I'm listening to uh, Dr. Jean and Dr. Paul talk about this, certainly we saw signs of anxiety when she was as early as two and a half. Really? Um, like what? She, she actually, we had um, a very you know, traumatic incident in our neighborhood where a child had been kidnapped. Um, and, you know, she started expressing some real concern that people were coming in the house to kidnap her. And, you know, our older daughter did, but it ended after a week. You know, we talked mm -hmm. to her and supported her through that. But the younger daughter, um, really, that, that uh, kept coming up over months and months. And, and, you know, we helped her and supported her. But at the time, we didn't think it was, you know, out of the norm particularly. But, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, Steve. Um, but uh, certainly she started showing signs of that at two and a half. How is she now? You know, she's doing very well, How thank you. How old is you. she now? She's 15, huh. so she's, uh, she's still, I mean, she has an anxiety disorder and she has learned how to manage uh, the symptoms of anxiety through lots of counseling and therapy that we uh, got for her. And as parents, we learned how to support her too. So I see the signs of anxiety rising on her face. I can, I can see her eyes start to become anxious. And certainly school is something that, uh, that all kids have to learn how to manage anxiety. But she has a bit more of a challenge to do that. And so uh, she's learned those skills um, to do that. But certainly, if we had been able to detect this higher than average level of anxiety when she was much younger, we probably wouldn't have gone into the situation we did, which is that she fell into a, a severe depression when she was 11. Mm. So, you know, I think that what uh, uh, Dr. Jean and Dr. Paul are talking about this early identification of these kids is really crucial to avoid very serious problems as they get older. Let's get the third doc in here as well. Dr. Peter, this example just given where mental health issues seem to be present at age 11, but actually on further reflection may have been, you know, reflected or there may have been signs from a much earlier age. How common is that? Uh, well, I think we know that sort of at any particular point in time, about one in five children will have a significant mental health problem. It's different kids at different times. It comes and it goes. But on average, if we look at the different developmental stages, it's about one in five. About one in 10 kids, so half of those, will have a chronic problem that lasts, I think like uh, Kim was mentioning, from early childhood all the way through. All the way through meaning for the rest of their lives? Well, you gotta remember that 75% of all adult mental health uh, disorders start before the age of 15. Hmm. So it all begins in childhood and adolescence. Right and we really have to pay attention to that. We mustn't underestimate the capacity of really young kids, like two, to be able to express their distress. They just do it in a way that we have to be developmentally sensitive to how they're expressing it, but they certainly express it, and we need to pay attention to that. Well, all right, let's do an example here. Dr. Jean, can you actually diagnose, let's say, schizophrenia in somebody as young as six? Um, at this point in time, uh, in terms of the research that's being done, so very early onset of schizophrenia is um, uh, in children 6 to 12. People have not been looking as much at the under sixes, uh, but what, uh, and part of that is because of the developmental expression of schizophrenia. You need the constructs built in the brain to be able to have that. However, so that's not there at six. It's not. Uh, it's beginning. It's, it's beginning, beginning um, uh, to to be shown. However, when you look at uh, videotapes of um, children or people, adolescents and adults who are who have schizophrenia 
schizophrenia and you look back, what you see is that there were some signs, un there may have been some signs under six. They may be uh, clumsiness. They may be maybe a bit more aloof. But that's that 2020 hindsight Kim was talking about. Well, or it mm -hmm. is. It is, or it is um, it's a way of us saying, okay, if there is a family history of schizophrenia, and there are these kinds of um, and there are these kind of behaviors that we're seeing. Maybe we need to pay a bit more attention to that because the brain is very plastic. That's how this age is very very different. Under six, it's very plastic. And are there ways, as we're seeing in autism, that you'd be able to interact, give experiences that would modify the brain development? Heads up helps you uh, um, create those things. Now that's in the realm of possibility sure. at well, this let's, point. Sure. Let's do it for instance here. Dr. Paul, if you are a parent and you have a child who you think may be manifesting mental health issues as early as four, five, six years old, what do you do? Well, I think the first thing you do is uh, you go and you see your pediatrician or your family doctor uh, and, and discuss your concerns. I, I truly believe that if a parent uh, senses that something is wrong, I as a pediatrician and I know my colleagues as pediatricians and others take that seriously. I think the first step is to open up and discuss the symptoms get your child fully evaluated. There are a whole slew of, uh, of uh, possibilities that we need to address. So, for example, uh, depending on the child's age, the child's social circumstances, the family so social circumstances. So we, need to, so we need to have sort of a complete picture of what's going on. So a parent has a concern, uh, goes and sees a health professional. The health professional will ensure, will take a history in terms of the, the child's past medical history, um, uh, social development, developmental milestones, and so on. And depending on what we find, we're going to um, have the child uh, assessed or treated, depending on the situation. Obviously, it's difficult for a pediatrician to make a diagnosis, or a family doctor, for that matter, to make a diagnosis at, at first sight. Uh, but again, it depends on, on the issue that the parents are talking about. Uh, if it's a child that's being uh, overly aggressive or it's a child that's they're fearing is not learning properly or is not speaking properly, it all depends. So we have a whole team approach of doing it. But I think the bottom line is that we, look, we, look, we need to look at the whole picture because the environment plays a role, the history plays a role, and the context plays a role. Dr. Peter, I, I get that every case is different and it, you know, it depends, as Dr. Paul just said. But how inclined do you think uh, mm -hmm. medicine writ large is to medicate starting at four, five, six, seven years old? Uh, <clears throat> tricky question. Uh, I th and I think there are important um, international differences here. I think uh, the system in the states where we have a lot more data uh, and that, you know, unusual healthcare system and how it's paid in the states really promotes the use of medication all the way across. I think in Canada, with our single payer system, we're allowed, I think, a much more comprehensive psychosocial approach to the management of these kinds of problems. So while I think uh, over medication in some circumstances is more common in the US, I think it's less common in Canada. But we don't really have good data in Canada. We don't really have a national survey of how many kids have disorder out there. We don't have uh, national information about who's getting what kind of treatment at what time and whether it's working. It's data we need. Kim, was it the case when your daughter was going through all this that, that a doctor at some point said to you, you need to medicate this child? No, actually, that's not, that's, that wasn't our experience. We visited a pediatrician first when um, she started to become sad, um, and they actually referred us to um, uh, a psychiatrist at that point. Unfortunately, we hit a very long wait times. Um, there was up to a year wait time for her to be seen. For, um, for a first visit to a For a very first visit. And there was wait time for her to see a professional in the community sector as well. Hmm. Um, so unfortunately, she deteriorated quite quickly and she became suicidal before we could uh, actually access any treatment at all. Hmm. And so um, then we entered into the acute care system and in the hospital setting. Uh, and, and then help comes quite rapidly and thereafter. Are, are meds part of the plan at that point? Uh, she was, she did, uh, she did start taking medications and I have to say they were extremely important in her recovery, but I would say equally as important 
is understanding, getting her to understand how to manage her thinking as well, and how to how she has to play a role in the management of it. So I think that uh, for many kids, you'll find that the medication is one piece of it, but learning, yeah. to, you know, learning to understand your thoughts and emotions and how to um, have better self-regulation and, and manage those thoughts is an crucial part of improvement. Let me do one more with you. It, it, you can't speak on behalf of all parents who go through sure. this thing, but but you, obviously in your experiences, you've talked to yeah. you know hundreds of parents dealing with this. Do parents have a kind of an attitude about their kids going on meds, generally I, speaking? I think that any parent is cautious about uh, medication. I think that uh, we were lucky that the uh, medical doctor that prescribed the medications gave us tremendous amounts of information about it. Um, but And so we took it from sort of an, an educated way, an informed way. But we also wanted to make sure that we had the right therapy and counseling that went hand in hand with it because in our research you needed both. Gotcha. Dr. Jean, you wanted to add? Yeah, just a, so just a, a couple of things. I, I, think, I, I think, Steve, your um, question going to medication um, is really uh, is really one of the issues that we have to address, uh, particularly under six, that we think mental uh, health care needs, we think medication. And what we know for children under six, and what many of us would say for beyond six, as Kim is saying, is that medication is one part, and we can't just focus on one part, if it is appropriate. All of the other things uh, surrounding the child is important. So I think when we're thinking about zero to six, we're not thinking about plunking a child on medication. Education. Okay, but what if you have to wait a year to get in to see somebody? Uh, so that's why, uh, and I think from the paper, uh, we're saying that the issues on under six... Is this six, the paper you're referring to? No, the, um, uh, the supporting, uh, supporting Ontario's Youngest Minds. Got it. Um, we're saying that we really need to be uh, increasing the number of people who are aware of what healthy child development looks like. So one of the issues that Paul has mentioned is that um, uh, pediatricians and family physicians may not be picking up the social and emotional challenges that babies are having. They may not be picking up that the child has an attachment problem. So we need to kind of raise the, raise the level of awareness so that we've got many more people who can do some work with the families before they get to a, a spot where there's a year for medication or a, a year wait. There's much that we can do in the community uh, working collaboratively, but it's not just um, psychiatry that works with little kids. Dr. Paul, what's your take on, on the advisability of medicating somebody who's as young as four or five or six and, and uh, manifesting mental health issues? Well, I, I, I certainly am not the first to jump in and give medications before we have a thorough understanding of what's going on. And I think that you asked the question, Steve, about parents, are they hesitant or not? And I can tell you that I've had a whole wide spectrum of parents coming to me with being fed up and saying, give my kid a pill to, I don't, they come, and the first thing they tell me is my child has a problem, but I don't want medications. So mm -hmm. we've got a whole spectrum of, of parents coming to us. Uh, my, my belief is that if, and, and I'd be very hesitant to give medication as the first, first line to a very young child, uh, multiple reasons and so on, but I do believe that when we are going to medicate a child, per, and, and more of an older child, because I'm more comfortable with medicating older children depending on the situation, you need to be able to present it, explain why, make sure you've made the proper diagnosis and analysis, and have what I call the, the sort of the, the treatment approach, the treatment plan, which part of which is the medication. You need to look at cognitive behavior therapy, social interaction, social support, perhaps physical, uh, physiotherapy, uh, occupational therapy, and so on. So it really is a package that you're tailoring for a specific child. And if medication is needed, it's not the one and only uh, magic cure. You're really presenting to the parent and talking about the side effects and talking about why you're giving it and why and what would happen if you're not giving it and so on. So it really it behooves us as, as pediatricians and healthcare professionals to really analyze and show to the parents that we've completely analyzed and understood it and just didn't sort of say, okay, here, take the medication and go home. That's not the way we should be dealing with these things. Gotcha. With this group of experts here, I want to raise... Uh an issue that was very controversial a few years ago. There was a New York, I know you've all seen this, New York Times Magazine piece that came out, I think three years ago this month actually. And it asked the controversial question, can you call a nine-year-old a psychopath? Saying that signs of psychopathy could be identified in kids as young as five. Let's do an excerpt from that piece written by Jennifer Kahn and then we'll chat about that. Here we go. The idea that a young child could have psychopathic tendencies remains controversial among psychologists. Lawrence Steinberg, 
A psychologist at Temple University has argued that psychopathy, like other personality disorders, is almost impossible to diagnose accurately in children or even in teenagers, both because their brains are still developing and because normal behavior at these ages can be misinterpreted as psychopathic. Others fear that even if such a diagnosis can be made accurately, the social cost of branding a young child a psychopath is simply too high. The disorder has historically been considered untreatable. Okay, Dr. Jean, we're three years since that article. What more do we know now? Uh, we know a lot more uh, through brain imaging uh, and, um, uh, and other strategies. The, uh, the, the uh, trait of um, cold unemotional uh, is being better, better understood. And in fact, uh, interestingly, a, a neuroscientist called James Fallon has written a book. He was studying, um, uh, he was studying psychopathy, doing scans on people and having control subjects. And he did the control subjects, uh, or he was going through the scans and he said, oh, this one's in the wrong pile and wanted to put it on the psychopathy pile and then found out it was his brain. Oof. Yeah, so very, very interesting. So was he a psychopath? Well, it turns out as he talked to his friends, they said, well, maybe not a psychopath, but you know, you're, you're maybe a bit of an a-hole sometimes, but you know, they, so they were, you know. Um, Did so, she just say what I thought she just I, said? No, yeah. not okay. an A, and yes, okay. anyway, so yeah. Okay. So, um, it's all Disney, uh, okay. Yes, so the, the, um, um, uh, the, the question, and I agree with um, Lauren Steinberg, that we cannot make a diagnosis, but we absolutely can see traits in children that are indicating that you know the rep ain't going so well hmm. you know that the relational piece is not going so well so what's very interesting are the studies now that are looking at is there a way that you can change some of the uh, the brain wiring of kids with these uh, with these traits it has to do with a whole bunch of different hmm. things how you respond to negative and, is and other things and people are actually looking at those um, huh. at those studies. The trick is, how do you know that this is one of the um, alleles that is um, cold and emotional? Mm. Um, uh, so as we learn more, we know less. You know, so as we learn more about it, we in fact know less, which we, we have to celebrate, but it's, it's, it's difficult. Frustrating. Uh, Kim, the piece also talks a lot about the stigma of mental illness. Mm -hmm. How much of that was an issue for your family when your daughter was in the th really in the throes of this four years ago? You know, we have always talked very openly about it because in our minds, um, mental illness is the same as physical illness. So for us, we treated it exactly the same as whether our daughter had cancer or other significant physical illness. But I, I, I would say that the receiving end for people we were talking to, sometimes they would be quite taken aback that we were talking so openly about the fact that our daughter had a very severe severe mental illness. Made them uncomfortable? It did, it made them uncomfortable. I would say though that I think the world is changing and shifting and I do think that people are more willing to talk about it. I was amazed that when we did share that many people would say, oh my son or oh my father and you know with the prevalence of mental illness as Dr. Jean said at one in four, one in five, um, you know we all have a brother or a sister or a friend who's really had a significant challenge with mental health okay. issues. Um, so, so stigma is, I think, dropping quite significantly and sharply right now. We should, I, I imagine I will get a comment on Twitter about this. So I want to ask you in anticipation of that sure. about this right now. I mean, your daughter's not the age of majority yet, but still she's old enough mm -hmm. to, she's old enough to have an opinion about whether she likes mom talking about her on, you know, television. Yes. Uh, do you sort of have her permission to be discussing her case in public like this? Yes, we have her, we have her, definitely have her permission. We have rules though. So the rules are we don't use her name, and her last name is different than mine, so that makes that easier. So she has this zone of privacy she, still. She still has a zone of privacy, and, uh, and we, we definitely make sure that we adhere to the rules that uh, we've agreed to. Gotcha. Okay, let me move on to Children's Mental Health Ontario having just completed its 2015 report card, and that is what I have here, I gather. Shall yes. I show it to the cameras? There we go right now. That's, well, that's not the whole report, that's just the, uh, the Coles Notes version, as we yes. say back in the day. State of Mental Health Services for Kids in Ontario Today. What's the headline? The headline is, there's just not enough services to provide for the children who really need help. So as, uh, as Dr. Paul, I think, and Dr. Jean were talking about, the really important pieces about helping kids with mental health issues are having those social supports, cognitive therapy available, all sorts of supports for families, Kids need a very personalized plan because they're all different and their brains are developing. 
different plans for kids who are very young, as Dr. Jean was talking about, all the way up to 18. And in the community sector, all those resources are there. They're waiting for kids. Um, and, but the problem is, we don't have enough capacity to service all the kids that, that are looking for care. As stigma is decreasing, parents and kids are reaching out for services, and they're not there. So it's a good thing they're reaching out for services. It is. It's a bad thing that they're reaching out and there's nothing on the other end. That's right. The stats are really incredible. Kids are waiting over a year, just like our experience, for services, and there's over 6,000 kids waiting across the province. And with demand increasing by 10% per year right now, we expect this number to double to 12,000 by 2016. Let me get Dr. Paul on that. A, a simple question, I suspect a more complicated answer. But why are so many more kids and their families seeking treatment for mental illness these days? I think uh, multiple factors. I think that there's more awareness about mental health issues. We, we, uh, it's been in the news lately and, it's been, and the awareness has been growing over the last 10 years. Um, and so I think that with the decrease in stigma and increase in awareness about the possibility in the education that we're doing, we are getting uh, a higher proportion of, of, of people asking for mental health uh, help for their kids. But let me tell you, Steve, that I, I started practicing pediatrics in the 1980s. And I can tell you that even in the 1980s, we always had difficulty getting children uh, the mental health and developmental support they needed. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that this study that's come out has just reinforced that. And so and all we're doing is increasing the awareness, decreasing the stigma, and, and making it, um, and it now it's becoming a bigger problem of a capacity to deal with it. If you ask me why this is occurring otherwise, is there a real rise, or is it because more people are, 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 are you know, thinking their child has a problem. Um, I think there are a multitude of, of issues, societal issues, um, the uh, upbringing, the social environment that perhaps have uh, uh, caused an increase in mental health, but I can't, I can't say that for sure. I can only speculate, but I can tell you for sure that the, the shortage and the frustration that I had as a pediatrician trying to get my patients to be seen uh, started back literally 20, 30 years ago, and, let's and it's do just a little, getting worse. So. Let, let's do a little compare and contrast here. We just heard Kim say that it took a year before she could get a specialist to see her daughter. Uh, how about in eastern Ontario? What's the waiting list like? It's, it's actually worse depending on where you are. If you're living in a rural area, it's probably 12 to 18 months. And it depends on the situation. I, uh, um, and uh, they're inundated uh, with, with these children. And it's, it's a very frustrating situation where you have limited capacity to be able to address these kids. And on top of that, they're, they're, most of these services are not in the eastern Ontario rural area. They're more in Ottawa, so they have to travel. So there's a lot of barriers that are even compounding the issue, especially in rural Ontario. Dr. Peter, can I get you on this? Sure. <clears throat> ISIS, which is the... Uh, oh, what a... Terrible acronym. Right, <laughs> sorry. Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. ICES. Yeah. ICES. Not the other one. Not the other one. Right. Uh, tracks uh, health data on the population. And they've got, they've recently come out with a really interesting scorecard uh, done by Paul Cardiac looking at mental health in kids. And there is a very sharp uptick in the use of mental health services with the uh, downturn in the economy. 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can mm -hmm. really see it on the graph. So the population has grown, so that's one important thing. And the second thing is, is that kids are very sensitive to the economic and psychosocial environment. And that's had a big impact on what's going on in Ontario. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jean. Uh, I think two concepts. I think one is when we look at the actual numbers and we look at the number of people in the profession, we are never going to be able to treat ourselves out of this difficulty. Um, and there's some elegant work that they've done in Manitoba around this. So it means that we really need to have a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is we need to be thinking about um, health promotion, building the mental well-being of children. This is the old upstream versus downstream argument. Uh, uh, upstream yeah. and downstream. Hmm. That we need to be having the high literacy knowledge about this for all people. Health promotion, so public health is in this, childcare um, um, is in this through the school system. Um, and we then need to be able to identify earlier when there's a little bit of 
of a risk and kids are going off track. Now, it doesn't mean get to uh, CMHO um, a, accredited place, but are there things within the school? At this number, and Kai Hai is going to say that show us Okay, too same. many acronyms, Jean. Hang yeah. on. CMHO is? Children's Mental Health Ontario. And Kai Hai yeah. is Canadian it's Institute the, for Health for Information. Health Information, okay. which is releasing a report on, um, on Thursday, which is indicating, or soon. 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 Yeah. yeah. Soon. Gotcha. Can I put, can I, of course I can. Here we go. This is your list. Other factors, because the, the, people may be under the assumption that if children experience mental health issues, it's because there's something happening in the brain that's clinical, not necessarily related to external factors, but you just told us, Dr. Peter, that it is related to, and here's your list, Gene. Mm -hmm. For example, you are more vulnerable to mental health problems if you're young if you're a child who experiences maltreatment, living in mm -hmm. socioeconomic disadvantage, those whose parents or caregivers themselves struggle with mental health problems, depression, substance abuse, for example, ethno-culturally diverse groups, First Nations kids, for example, very young refugees and immigrants may suffer mental health more than the general population, those involved in the child welfare system, those with neurodevelopmental disorders, like obsessive compulsive disorder or developmental delays. The, so the, the, your socioeconomic factors can significantly affect your mental health. That's mm -hmm. your Absol conclusion. Absolutely. No question at all about that. Um, and Dr. Paul can speak more on that as a, a public health. But, um, you know, I'm a Mac grad, Peter and I are, so uh, here's the list. But what do I know about this list? And so if we're trying to see what are, what are things that are common throughout there, what we see is toxic stress. So that kids living in situations where there is high stress, whether that is poverty, homelessness, um, all, those, all those things, then the brain gets wired up differently. The building of the brain is through experiences. So if you're experiencing toxic stress, like that list is, and you don't have an adult who's able to buffer the impact of that stress because they have no services or you know, all that list, the common mechanism is the stress. It's not, you know, families who may be listening who live in poverty um, shouldn't be thinking, oh my God, I live in poverty, my kid's at risk. Mm -mm. It is the stress of living in poverty. So if you're reading to your child and you live in poverty, if you're doing this kind of one-on-one -on -one serve and return, your child's not going to have mental health issues. It's the stress associated with all of those at this vulnerable age that builds the brain that leads to different stress pathways. Who wants to answer a political question here? Oh, here's, here's the, I do. Okay, let's go, <laughs> Dr. Peter, here we go. Here's the political question. It sounds like you're all arguing that with the influence of external factors, like a bad economy, like a lack of services, like stress in the home, this kind of thing, is, are, are you advancing the argument that we need the government to be much more actively involved in promoting the wellness of this economy so that our mental health problems reduce. Yes. Yes. That's a no-brainer, right? That's a no-brainer. Now, are yes. we going, are we taking the next step, which is to say you therefore prefer a small, I don't want to get partisan here, but a small L liberal approach to government involvement in the economy as opposed to a small C conservative approach. Can I use the word progressive and distribution of resources, equal distribution? I think Canada has a real problem with inequality. Right, economic inequality. So it's not only uh, poverty is an absolute thing, it's the relative poverty or the relative inequality that's a real problem. And I think addressing that in a, in a uh, macro way, at a community way, in a public health way, I think that's what Gene's talking about, is that that paradigm shift is a shift towards greater involvement of public health. And that will require, I think, addressing these structural inequalities. Let me get Kim and Dr. Paul on this as well. Go ahead, yes. Kim. Well, I think that, that, that they're making very solid points here. I mean, I think that that, that toxic stress that Jean talks about is really important. I think that, you know, the, the reason why I think the government and politically they have to act on these wait times and wait lists for kids is because in the community sector, our professionals who work there, they address families with these issues. They, they not only help the children and youth who are experiencing the mental health issues, but they deal with the families as well. And they sort through some of these issues and help the families be able to better support their children despite the fact they're under significant amounts of stress. So I think that you need to. You need the prevention promotion piece to try and reduce stress around families, but you also need the right kinds of services for kids and families 
um, right when they need them. So they can't wait for these kinds of things uh, because they're only going to get worse. Dr. Paul. Well, Steve, this is dear to my heart because, I, you know, if you ask me politically what I want, I want every parent uh, uh, new, of a newborn child to have the ability to hug their child as much as they want. And that's a political statement that has uh, uh, overtones. For example, um, you know, 70% of what makes our health, be it mental health or physical health, has really nothing to do with our biology. It has to do with our environment. And those are what we call the social determinants of health. And so from a from a public health point of view, we see disparities among rich and poor, for example, or neighborhood to neighborhood in terms of children not being ready for school at five years of age, the EDI scores. In countries where there is that social, what I call network or support for parents, where they do spend a, lot of, a bit more money than we do uh, on that, you don't see the disparities between neighborhoods. So you can even the playing field by being able to support uh, that, what I call postnatal period, where you are allowing or, allowing the, or fostering an environment. And again, I'm talking in the socioeconomic cultural point of view, whereby parents can hug their kids and interact with their kids. So t and take those obstacles out of the way, because I think that is the foundation for long-term health for long-term mental health wellness and prosperity. And this is a new paradigm in chronic disease prevention and, and mental health wellness over the life course. And this is a new perspective that we're trying to, to do. I've been trying to speak to my colleagues. I speak to some politicians and so on. This is what we're trying to address. And if you want to look at it from the economic point of view, the um, uh, Toronto Dominion Bank has actually brought an economic uh, point where $1 invested today in early child development gives you a return of between 4 and $7 and triple that sometimes in high-risk areas. Okay, I, I'm going to try, I'm going to go at this one more time. Dr. Jean, I'm going to go at it with you. I can see some people who take a more conservative view of what the government ought to or ought mm -hmm. not to be doing in terms of its role in the economy. I can see them saying, of course, you've got four guests on the show, all of whom are paid uh, by the taxpayer, quote unquote, all of whom are in the public sector. Of course, they believe in a larger role for the government uh, to, um, you know, to deal with this problem. Of course they do. That's not news. So what would you say to them to say that this is not about that? It isn't about that. The I knew you were going to say that, but did, why is that? Thanks for the, yeah. thanks for the lead <laughs> in there, Steve. Um, the, the, issue, the issue is um, uh, has to do with sight and what your view of the child and the family is. But simply, when our children do well, we all do well. So a government that has a view, as our First Nations people have, that we need to be making decisions and thinking about the next seven generations is the government that I will support, that has children at the heart of the matter. When our children do well, we all do well. So when you have uh, someone who perhaps thinks that by giving people um, $160 a month that you could build our public education system, what would happen? If we said uh, we're going to build a public education system by giving everyone $160 uh, a month, would we have a public education system? Does well, that you, have you'd have a different system? That's for sure. Uh, well, or different, or no? There's a few <laughs> letters different there. Um, but the the it, I think it has to do very very deeply with what your approach is. Now, having said that, in Ontario. I think that we have a government that has done phenomenal things for kids in terms of our uh, education, our full day of learning, uh, and even the mental health transformation that's going on just now. They're saying that kids and the economy go hand in hand. When our kids are doing well and prepared well and families are supported well, then our economy will, uh, will do well. The evidence is overwhelming, but there are people who are not, um, they don't govern by research or evidence, I understand. Moving right along. Uh, we've got a few minutes left here for this discussion, and I want to get each of you in, say, 30 or 40 seconds to give me one idea for what you believe the best thing we can do to increase the resiliency and therefore hopefully um, prevent significant mental health issues from uh, happening in our kids' lives. Dr. Paul, start us off. One idea. I think uh, my idea is to be able to, from day one of life, be able to read to a child, interact with the child, and involve everybody in the family. Parents often get tired and, and share that responsibility. It takes a community to raise a child. It's just that tender, loving care will go a long ways, both in terms of mental health and physical health overall. Gotcha. Kimberly. 
think we need to have the resources in place to support those families who need help who th so that they can provide that warm, nurturing environment for their children. That involves politics, right? It does, and I think that uh, you, you said make the, make the investment case for those people who say, you know, how can we make sure we're investing our money in the right place? You know, we can demonstrate that if we invest in children's mental health treatment, that we can see reductions in costs all throughout other places in the government, in hospital sector, in the education sector, in child welfare and youth justice sectors. So it is a strong investment, and that's how we can, we can talk to the naysayers. Dr. Jean. I thought you were going to go in order there. Okay, so um, I think uh, so. What I think needs to happen is a, a paradigm shift. So a big thing um, that we think about children's healthy development as everybody's business. It's everybody, every day, everywhere, and that is um, uh, that requires a whole of government approach. It means that we need to be thinking about data collection across the government and uh, linking the data so we know what's what. And the kind of basic structure is to have literacy about healthy development and resilience be the air that we breathe. Have that for everybody. Then have a group of people who are able to say, hmm, it's not going so well. Uh, or, oh, look at what this child is able to do. So there be a smaller group of people who can recognize hmm, things are not going on uh, quite right and you can very quickly connect to not necessarily tertiary but other resources in the community early year centers professional learning online resources and then we've got a very smaller group um, that are those who can say we we are not alone in helping this young person deal with this mental illness but I think if we go if we have that kind of literacy for all knowledge particular knowledge for some and treatment knowledge uh, for a few, with that paradigm, I think that we'll see a, a very big, but it takes all government. It's across all of our sectors. Dr. Peter. Well, how can I <coughs> add, uh, build on that? It's all been I, said. It's all been said. It's beautiful. <laughs> I'm just going to highlight the importance of measurement. If you can't measure it, measure it, it doesn't exist. Hmm. So we have to have a measurement framework where we're measuring kids' development, and then somebody has to be accountable for changes in that over time. And I think that would make a huge difference in how we promote kids' health, and mental health in particular, uh, uh, in Canada. Absolutely. Okay. I've left him for last, because I'm not done with him yet. The rest of you I'm done with. Dr. Yeah. Paul Romeliotis yes. from Eastern Ontario yes. Health Unit. It's so good of you to join us from the nation's capital on TVO tonight. Thanks so much, Dr. Paul. Thank you. My pleasure, Steve. And here in our studio, Dr. Jean Clinton from McMaster University, Kimberly Moran from Children's Mental Health Ontario, and that guy who we're not done with yet. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.